Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord, I pray now that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts might be acceptable unto you, for you are truly our rock and our redeemer. We pray this all in Christ's holy name. Amen. Amen. So the text for today is a little bit different than what you hear on Palm Sunday, isn't it? <laughs> you guys were expecting, Hosanna! Hosanna in the highest! And, you know, this triumphant march into the city of Jerusalem and, and all of the things that we've heard over and over and over and over again, if you were raised in any type of Christian setting, um, those are the stories that, that we are used to on Palm Sunday. Well, you guys know me. I don't really take the traditional route. <laughs> So, this story, this narrative, is a part of the beginning of the passion narrative for this week as we look at the journey to the cross. And, of course, we remember Jesus coming in triumphantly on the back of a donkey. And all of the things that surrounded that narrative. And then we fast forward just a little bit to a time where Jesus is now um, almost there at the Last Supper and beginning to make some proclamations about what is going to happen. And so this story um, helps guide us in to the passion narrative, um, what Jesus will go through, um, the betrayals. And so I thought maybe it's important to not just look at Jesus in, in these moments, but to, to focus in on some of the characters who are on the margins, who play a role, if you will, in, in this story and in the passion narrative and what's going on. Because I think sometimes we forget about all of the others. Today I want to talk about, I want to talk about Judas and Peter. Now, you probably have never heard a sermon preached on Judas, right? How many people do we know named Jesus or Jesus, but how many people do you know named Judas? We don't, we don't oftentimes talk about Judas and, and his role. He's the villain, if you will. Now, we've, we've vilified Judas. We don't like him because of his role in the death of Jesus, but, but it was an important role. And sometimes, sometimes I believe that we are Judas. As much as we like to partner ourselves with other disciples, sometimes we're, we're Judas. Sometimes we sell out Jesus. And if we look at the passion narrative, um, particularly around those who betray Jesus. There are two that betray Jesus. One is Judas, which is foretold. Jesus talks about it and says that Judas will basically sell him out. But then there's also Peter, who betrays Jesus, and G which is also foretold. Jesus tells, tells Peter, says, you, by the time, the, you know, the crow crows, then you, you're going you're gonna to deny me. And I wonder, I wonder what, what's the difference here? Why do we vilify Judas and, and lift Peter? Peter becomes the foundation, the rock of the church, by which all other churches, even now, our faith is built upon. And Judas is is just the villain. I wonder why. I wonder why we do that. Well, let's see. In a story just uh, preceding the one that we are talking about now, Jesus and the disciples go to a home, and there in that home, a young lady comes, and she washes Jesus' feet with some very expensive oil. Think y'all remember that story? Yes? And 
as she is doing this, then the disciples get very angry, particularly Judas, that how could she possibly be wasting this oil on Jesus? How could she possibly be wasting something so expensive on the Savior? What's going on here? He gets very upset because what he sees is worldly value in the oil. Now, we have to remember that Judas was the, was the purse carrier, if you will, for the, the traveling group of, of disciples and, and all who traveled with them. So he was always doing the accounting. He wanted to make sure that they had enough money, denarius, to do all of the things that they were doing. And so he is concerned with, with the money, with the finances, and let's be fair, kind of with the world. Oftentimes Judas um, is told that, you know what, the focus is not the world, but the focus is on divine things. The same is true of Peter, right? When Jesus tells them the narrative that, hey, you know what, I will have to go to the cross and I will have to die so that the sins of the world will be forgiven, Peter jumps at Jesus and says, no, Jesus, you cannot. And what does, what does Jesus tell him? Get behind me, Satan. You don't have the things of God in mind. You have the things of the world in mind. These two kind of parallel along in the scriptures. Peter is constantly getting it wrong. In fact, I think Jesus checks Peter more times than any other disciple in, in scripture. And yet, again, Judas is the villain. And here we have in this story, now Judas kind of playing out the role which Jesus had forecast. And his focus is once again on money, on the world. I wonder how many times we do this in the church. When we focus not on the divine things, not on where God is leading us, not on what Jesus is doing, but we focus more on finance, money, the world. And so he, is, he has an opportunity. It says in verse 14, then one of the 12 who was called Judas Iscariot went to the chief priest and says, what will you give me if I betray him to you? Basically saying, what is Jesus worth? What is the human value? What is the worldly value for his life? If I hand him over to you, what can I get? How much is a human life worth? In that day, the 30 pieces of silver, um, if we equate it to today's dollars, we say that a drachma was approximately a one day's wages and one drachma or 30 pieces of silver is um, four times the drachma. So it's about 120 days of wages. Today, that would equate to about $3,000. Not much. $3,000 is what Jesus' life was worth to Judas. If we look at um, some of the census data and economists, over the course of COVID, they do these calculations actually on um, calculating what, how much a, a human life is worth. Basically, how much would a government spend in order um, at what, what is the total value that the government would spend before um, realizing that it's a, a human life 
right? So in other words, when they were doing the uh, calculations for um, some of the information that would go out during COVID and how many people could work, right, our, our critical workers, they calculated the value of a human life at $10 million. $10 million. So, and they get to this calculation by saying, well, if someone um, would take a one in $25,000 um, chance at going to work and getting COVID and dying at work, if that person would accept $400 in addition to their annual salary and still go to work, then that's the value of how much they're worth in a lifetime. It's crazy, I know. $10 million is the value of a life in our current economy. And I wonder, sometimes when we, when we think about our ministry, our work as a church, and, and, and following our values, do we equate human life in the same way? Do we say that, you know, a life is just worth $10 million or do we put a dollar value on it? And do we sell out our faith in response to the $10 million? Let me give you an example. In our country, we average about 20 deaths of homeless persons a day. About 20 deaths of homeless people a day. Is that worth it? Is it worth it to be people of faith who say I can do something about homelessness and instead of doing something about homelessness, instead of going to our legislatures, instead of giving more, instead of paying more taxes, instead of doing things that would help those who are, are in need, you say, what, it's only $10 million a person? I wonder if we sell out our faith and not help those who are in need. This year, 9,800 people have died due to gun violence. And we're only in the fourth month of the year, just beginning the fourth month of the year. 132 mass shootings, 398 children dead. And as Christians who are believers, who sit in high places, who sit in places of authority, have we asked the question of the world, what is my faith worth to you? Amen. What is the value that I put on human life? What is the value that I can sell out my God, sell out my Jesus, sell out all of his teachings to you so that I may continue to have what I want and what I need? I believe that the reason we vilify G Judas is because we see ourselves reflected in him. We see that we are not moved to the point of actually doing something about what's going to occur because we're so willing to allow Jesus to go to the cross. And in fact, not only are we willing to let Jesus go to the cross, but we're willing to sell him out. We're not willing to stand up against the politicians. We're not willing to make great laws that could affect and save lives. But rather, we're quite comfortable in what we're doing. The difference between Peter and Judas is that Peter repents. Peter repents even after he denies Jesus, he repents and falls in the mercy of the disciples. He finds a home there and he finds that in the discipleship, in those who are believers, 
They had just heard the words of Jesus in the Last Supper say, I am pouring out, I will pour out my blood in the, for the forgiveness of sins. And Peter relies on that. He comes back to his community. And Jesus, or Judas, does not. Judas goes to the high priest. He goes to the world. And he repents there. The world, the priest, could care less about his forgiveness. Could care less about the ways that he had sold out Jesus. And so, we find that in this story, Judas takes the values of the world, brings them into the ministry, and sells out Jesus, and never receives that forgiveness. Now, I believe that if Judas had offered a true repentance, that he would have been forgiven. I believe that his spirit would be among those with God in the afterlife, and I can't say for certainty that he isn't. He played a vital role. But he does show us something very critical about ourselves, that sometimes we just get it wrong. Sometimes we focus in the wrong direction. And Jesus, during this passion narrative, during this week, as he takes this journey to the cross, he is trying to remind us and to remind his disciples that he is going to die for the sins of the world. And that our focus has to be on divine things, not worldly things. Our focus has to be on God's kingdom, not the human kingdom. And that when we focus on God's kingdom, then we can make changes here and now. That we can fulfill the promise just like Jesus did to heal the sick, to heal the lame, to meet those who are on the margins, to make true and righteous changes even within our political systems that help and save lives. But we have to ask ourselves a very critical question. And that critical question is the one that Judas asked. What is it worth? What is your life worth? What is the value that we put on every human life that has died due to homelessness and poverty? What is the value that we put on every life that has died due to gun violence in our country? And why can't we make the critical changes to save lives? Why can't we do it? I think that what we learn here is that in our journey to the cross, we see both the frailty of human existence and the beauty of divine grace. That Jesus is constantly offering us a doorway into that divine grace a way to be changed and transformed and made new, a way for us to see the value of human life and a way for us to be disciples who follow in the footsteps. If we truly believe during this week that Jesus took this journey so that lives might be saved and that a transformation might take place, then we have to turn our eyes away from being stuck on human value and look at what God is doing. Look at what God is changing and open up our hearts, our minds, and our spirits 
to see value and worth in every individual and in our faith. Oftentimes when I talk about political things in sermons, people get all upset. They're like, this preacher talking politics. And I could tell you that social justice is different than politics. And the truth of it is that we all have value. We all live in this human existence. Each and every one of us go through the same experiences in human life. And if I'm talking about things that affect all of us, it's not really about politics. It's about what is the value of human life and how can we do things as Christians to secure our lives here? Because let's remember, Jesus said, as above, so below, as is done in heaven, let it be done on earth. And he goes to the cross so that we have the power and authority to do these things and to help the world to see the value of life. It's not about politics, friends. It's about our desire to be unstuck from the world. And so today, as we journey into the Holy Week, as we take the steps with Jesus to Monday, Thursday, and the Last Supper, and then Good Friday, and the death of Jesus, and ultimately the joy and hope and exuberance that we celebrate on Easter morning, let us remember that this journey is still continuing. That we are still walking the path behind Jesus as he went triumphantly into Jerusalem. We are still followers that have the opportunity to enter in to God's spirit and to create God's kingdom here on earth. But only if it's worth it to us. I pray that we see the worth, the value of Jesus Christ in this week. And I pray that we don't skip so quickly to Easter without reflecting upon ourselves in the ways that we have sold out God in our lives like Judas. Let us pray. Blessed and gracious Savior, Lord, we are so thankful for the ways in which you reveal to us your will for our lives. God, there are times in our lives that we don't get it. Don't get it. We, we fail to see your message. Sometimes we're like Peter, and you reprimand us, and we snap to it, and we get it, and then we go, oh, I'm so sorry, Lord. And we come back to your community. And then other times, Lord, we just don't get it. We stay held up on the things of the world. We stay held up on holding on to the values that the world has taught us that we can't see with your eyes. Fill us, God, with a sense of your, your vision, your understanding. Help us to see the worth and value of our faith and the lives in which you have put into our care. God, we ask this as your repentant people taking this journey to the cross. In Christ's holy name, we pray. And we pray as the way that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
I want to share with you a, a prayer that was written by a friend of mine who is in the North Georgia Annual Conference. His name is Chris Rapko. He's a pastor at Mount Zion Church back there. He says this, Lord, I confess that today does not seem appropriate for your parade, not when yet another tragedy, one in a long litany of such tragedies happened again in Nashville this week. Not when two weeks of tornadoes have killed around 50 people and have weakened or have wreaked havoc in Mississippi, West Georgia, Alabama, Arkansas, and the Midwest. We long for you to come into our city, our nation, our world, mounted on a horseback and ready to defeat evil once and for all. We long for the suffering that we encounter to cease. We'd become a parade that stops us from being overwhelmed by despair. We'd welcome a parade that stops us from being overwhelmed by despair. Instead, your parade is so different that we hardly recognize it as a parade. If we'd known better, we too would be wondering, with the whole city of Jerusalem, who is this guy on the donkey? Often, we don't know better. But if we followed you closely this Lent, we wouldn't be surprised that your parade is humble and something other than the mighty victory of empire because you always were on the margins, healing and restoring, blessing and saving. You had a mind, you had in mind another outcome the whole time. You knew what the end of the parade had in store for you, a final and ultimate act of solidarity with the outcast, the marginalized, the oppressed, and the broken. Lord, help us bring your humble, satirical parade to those who need the parade most, those who are downtrodden, those in need of healing, and those who yearn to be whole. Number us among your crowd, proclaiming your reign through humble service that inspires others to give all of themselves for the cause of your kingdom, for which we pray as you taught us. Amen.